Eleven Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at Eleven Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to Eleven Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Fast-moving thieves leaving a family business in shatters for the second time in just months. And an unexpected catch on a Georgia river, how 30 guns may have ended up in the water. Plus a dangerous new TikTok challenge already proving deadly, and it involves something you probably have in your medicine cabinet. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Again, Lonergan under center. Diggs, touchdown, ball game. It is Friday night. People all across the state are pumped up for the beginning of high school football, but some schools are pumping the brakes instead because of concerns about COVID-19. Either way, football is going to look very different in the weeks and months ahead. This week's Team 1-1 Game of the Week is at Eagles Landing Christian Academy. And we will have highlights from across Metro Atlanta tonight at 11 on 11 Alive. Meanwhile, our Maria Martin reports on how schools are navigating all of the changes and the new safety measures. High school football is back. Just talk about the excitement around the fact that we are going to have some games out there on the field. I think everybody is so excited to see it back. And, you know, I, I think, you know, when you see watch the Corky Kale games and, you know, you see the excitement in there, people are like, OK, this is really going to happen. Look, there's been a lot of hard work. You know better than anybody that there is a lot that goes into putting on high school football in the middle of a pandemic. Let's talk about what that hard work has looked like in every one of the GHSA, their effort to get to the point where we are now. I think, it, you know, I think the easiest way to kind of sum it up is that, you know, we're doing the things that we have always taken for granted. And when you start thinking about the social distancing in the crowd or the capacity limits, you know, a lot of people are coming in at 25% capacity, 30% capacity, and then you've got to figure out what that looks like because you want to make sure that the parents can be there. I I'm glad that you brought up safety because that's really paramount. The GHSA, they put those policies in place, but you know, every school is different. They're kind of under their own guidelines. Why put it that way? It, it's not a one size fits all. And you know, everybody's got a different size stadium. You've got a different layout. You know, COVID-19 has impacted that community in different ways. And so, so there was no way just to say, hey, here's a blanket statement that everybody's gonna have to abide by. You've got to provide good guidance at the high level and then make sure that your ADs and their staff and their coaches can solve for all those little things. As we mentioned, a couple of schools have already been forced to call off games due to coronavirus. And tonight, Blessed Trinity's football game against Forsyth Central is canceled. According to a letter from Forsyth Central's principal, one of the Blessed Trinity players tested positive for COVID. We have reached out to that school, but we have not heard back as of yet. In Gwinnett County, Mill Creek and Burkmar both forced to cancel after somebody on each team tested positive and several others were exposed. 
Despite the new safety measures in place, there still are many concerns about how closely they will be followed. And this is what it looked like on Wednesday night at West Forsyth, the high school game there. We saw many fans without masks sitting close together. We reached out to the school about this. The school says it is a choice for fans to attend the events. The school, like many others, is limiting stadium capacity, adjusting seating, and adding signage about masks. However, it is up to fans when it comes to following those measures. Well, as we head into the Labor Day weekend, the downward trend in new COVID-19 cases seems to have stalled. Today, the Department of Public Health reported nearly 2,100 new positive test results. That's significantly higher than the number we reported on Memorial Day, a weekend seen as the start to the summer surge. On that day, DPH reported 498 cases. Sadly, the number of people dying from the virus is also high and holding steady. DPH reported 63 more deaths today. Remember, these are reported as DPH is able to verify the information, so many of these people actually died weeks ago. Meanwhile, as college students leave campus for the holiday weekend, many wonder what school will look like when they return with COVID cases already on the rise at many schools. Our Caitlin Ross spoke to students at Georgia Tech who say they don't know what to expect. Students aren't the only ones concerned. Colleges across Georgia sent out alerts to their populations over this past week, warning students to be careful, wear masks and socially distance over the Labor Day holiday. But will that be enough? Students on Georgia Tech's campus say they're worried after 39 new cases were reported yesterday alone. They say the school has been inconsistent in its messaging about housing, first telling students who share a room they would have to move out, then backing down and calling the moves voluntary. In an email sent to parents, administrators said their campus testing surveillance program indicated there was a high spread among roommates, but said it's ultimately up to each family whether their student remains in a double occupancy room. Because logistically, there are so many moving parts, and I feel like we keep being told how difficult it is and how many things they're doing to make sure the situation is safe. But there was a very easy way for them to make the situation safe before all of this happened. That would have um, I think made it easier for them to have a, a good online class experience at the very least, whereas now we're on campus and I don't think anybody is very happy right now. Fourth year student Kelly O'Neill worries if the COVID-19 infection rate gets any higher, students will be forced to go fully virtual, even though most of them are already taking a majority of their classes online. A spokesperson for Georgia Tech says they are testing 2,000 people a day for COVID-19 as part of their voluntary surveillance program. Many residents in DeKalb County woke up to this health alert, reminding people about measures to take over the holiday weekend to curb the spread of COVID-19. It is a message that was echoed by Governor Kemp, he and the First Lady traveling the state, reminding people not to let their guards down over the Labor Day weekend. Mara Seriani has more from DeKalb County. Governor Kemp's message ahead of the holiday weekend, he says, don't let your guard down and let's keep Georgia moving in the right direction. This progress can be erased very quickly if we grow complacent and ignore the guidance and public safety measures that we have in place. Governor Kemp shared his message this morning before getting on a plane to tour the state. Ahead of the Labor Day weekend, he's asking all Georgians to do four things. Wear your mask, practice social distancing, wash hands often, and follow his executive order. Kemp pointed to Memorial Day weekend and the 4th of July as two examples of when Georgia saw a surge in COVID cases and hospitalizations. Georgia's governor has been criticized by some for not enforcing a mandatory statewide mask mandate. Today, Kemp asked everyone to be responsible. But there's also people that don't need a government mandate to do the right thing. And that's why I'm here today asking people to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, and follow those four simple guidelines. Today, Governor Kemp is also making stops in Valdosta, Augusta, and Savannah. Let's take a look at some other big headlines for you today. A traffic stop on Georgia 400 ends with two custodians from South Forsyth High School facing drug charges. Police say they found several bags of meth inside Katrina Herrick's car. Fellow custodian Brent Charlie was also charged. The Forsyth Board of Education says they are no longer employed by the district. Attorneys for singer R. Kelly filed a motion today asking a federal judge to release him. Kelly is appealing a ruling that denied his release pending trial. The federal judge that initially denied it called him a flight risk. Kelly is awaiting trials on multiple sex crimes charges in four jurisdictions in three states. 
DeKalb County Police searching for this man seen without a shirt attacking a man at a bus stop. The victim, Bruce Mitchell, died days later at the hospital. It happened August 17th near Wesley Chapel and Snapfinger Woods Drive. Yesterday, police arrested the man in the white shirt, charging him with murder. Police say the pair were trying to rob the victim. The Georgia Department of Natural Resources now mourning the loss of a veteran captain killed when he was hit by a car while on duty. According to the Georgia State Patrol, Captain Stanley Elrod was struck by the driver of a Chevrolet Cobalt last night in Madison County. This afternoon, the DNR tweeted their condolences to Elrod's family, saying he made everyone better through his actions. Governor Kemp also offering sympathy to the family. I hope all Georgians will join Marty, the girls, and I in keeping the Elrod family in your thoughts and prayers. Elrod has been with the DNR for 28 years. The driver in that wreck now has been arrested and is facing several charges. New video tonight showing thieves hitting a Buckhead jewelry store. Second time in about three months. The owner telling Joe Hankey it is too much to bear after vandals looted the store back in May when a night of protests eventually turned violent. After the first break in back in May at a state jewelers behind me here in Buckhead, the owners tell me they spent several months cleaning up all the damage and restocking their inventory. They were almost back to business as normal. And then last night it happened all over again. At 12.45 this morning, surveillance video shows three people breaking into a state jewelers. They shattered the display cases, loaded up a box with jewelry, broke into the back of the store, but the owners say the thieves cannot open the safe. Time stamps show after one minute and 51 seconds, the trio takes off. Eight minutes later, an Atlanta police car drives up. Watching the video, Ala Isakov says is heartbreaking. Her family owns the state jewelers. Isakov says they are still adding up the stolen jewelry and damages, but it will be in the tens of thousands of dollars. It's just a mess. It's sad. It's glass everywhere. It's still a little shaken. Um, we're trying to recover from the last break in, and then we, we walk into this again. Walking into this again, this video from May 30th shows around a dozen people breaking in. A night of protests over racial injustice in downtown Atlanta turned violent, and people looted stores from downtown to Buckhead. Isaacov says the damage and stolen property totaled $90,000, and so far police have not given them any updates on the investigation. This night in May temporarily closed the business. We were just trying to clean up, so we just finally set up again and, and restored all the showcases and set it up to where we can be functional again, just to start from the beginning. Now today they're cleaning up again. Whether any of the same people from the May break-in broken again last night is unknown. They had masks on, they had gloves on, and you can't even see their faces, so it's hard to tell. Atlanta police tonight needing help solving both break-ins. Anyone with information is asked to contact APD. Coming up, two Georgia brothers reel in dozens of guns from one river. Now investigators are fishing for answers. It's an alluring story. Very interesting. I got you there too, Jeff. I the re it's real too. <laughs> real. Don't forget, we are streaming right now on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and get in on the 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 jokes here with Jeff and I. And in, lame in jokes. The community section. We've got more <laughs> 11 Alive news in prime time ahead. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, 
and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing? A cafe in Midtown vandalized. The owner took his frustrations to social media and he couldn't believe what happened next. 11 Alive's Brittany Klein, Peter, shares his story. I was angry. I mean, I'll own it. I'm a person. Known for its outdoor garden with a living koi pond and a fountain, Fab's Midtown brings people from around Atlanta to dine on the patio. Last week, the owner, Randy Adler, says vandals hit the garden. It was just random vandalism. I think all this added polarization has whipped up a frenzy of hate no matter what, and people act out destroying beautiful things. Adler dedicated a part of the garden in his mother's honor after he lost her to COVID-19 earlier this year. He wrote in a Facebook post, the flowers he planted in his mother's honor were destroyed, sculptures broken, and trash thrown in the fountain. So I just kind of, you know, kind of let it come out. And then the next day, we had people in the neighborhood walk by dropping off cash, plants. We had groups offering, you know, what can we help you clean up and do? Adler's post was shared hundreds of times. It was crazy. Like, they sent us pictures of their children eating lunch. They sent us memories. I mean, you know, it's my business and I love it. We've been here a while, but we didn't, I didn't really realize how attached people are to the restaurant. The garden is cleaned up and reopened with the help of the community. When we bleed, they bleed. When we cry, they cry. When we feel victimized, they feel victimized. We have so many people that feel so safe here. Adler shared with me that he wasn't able to find the same flowers that he had planted in his mother's honor locally, but that a customer drove 60 miles to find the flowers, bring them back, and donate them. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Are you noticing that the sun is setting a little bit earlier? It's getting darker earlier. And uh, we have a little bit of a difference between the sunset last night and tonight's sunset. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but last night's sunset was at eight o'clock. This is gonna be the last time uh, until next spring that we see sunsets at eight or after eight o'clock. Tonight's sunset is at 758. So yeah, those those days are getting the, the light going into the evening hours, getting a little bit shorter. The sunsets are coming earlier and it's getting darker out there. And you're probably noticing it out there right now as yeah, we still have some light of day, but it is getting darker a little bit sooner. Temperatures are still warm though in the mid 80s. We'll drop into the lower 80s by 11 and I'm thinking by 11 o'clock we'll be at 79 midnight 78 and then by tomorrow morning starting off with temperatures in the lower 70s in town. I do think we'll see some 60s in the outlying areas with mainly clear skies. It's going to be a nice start and then in the afternoon it's going to be nice as well. In fact, we're bringing the wasometer up to a 10. Today was a 9 as we had a high temperature of 92 degrees, but now that we're moving back into the 80s, I know it's the upper 80s. It's still going to be really hot out there. We're bringing it to a 10 as it's a holiday weekend. It is going to be dry. We'll have a lot of sunshine mixing in with a few clouds and the relative humidity levels are going to start coming down just a little bit. Now tonight I want you to watch that system that we were telling you about that's going to sag into North Georgia with very limited moisture with it, but it is going to kick off just a couple of showers here during far North Georgia and in parts of Northwest Georgia, but that's falling apart as it moves closer to Atlanta. I do think we'll see just a few clouds around out there for tonight, but then as we start the day tomorrow, it is going to be a nice start with dry conditions, plenty of sunshine, sunny skies at, at noon, and then once we get into the afternoon hours, still mostly sunny skies, maybe just a couple of clouds mixing in. And as we're going through this long holiday weekend, that dry weather is going to continue with us on Sunday too, with sunshine to start. But I want you to know on Sunday and Monday, the mornings will be just a little bit cooler. Now we're going to be talking about lows in the 60s for Sunday and Monday, and that's thanks to the drier air in place that's allowing those temperatures to fall a little bit more. But then in the afternoon on Sunday, we will be just shy of 90, topping off there with temperatures that will be uh, in the uh, mid to upper 80s for the afternoon hour. So here's that seven day forecast as we head through that long holiday weekend. A 10 on the wasometer Saturday, Sunday and Monday. 
High Saturday at 89, then 87 on Sunday and Monday. But then look at those morning temperatures right around 67 Sunday morning, 66 on Monday morning, 65 on Tuesday morning. As a few more clouds start to build in on Tuesday, a chance for a shower late Tuesday. I really think the better rain chances will come in Wednesday, Thursday and Friday each day. About a 40% chance for some of those scattered showers. High temperatures 86 Wednesday, 87 Thursday, 86 again on Friday and 86 is right where we should be for this time of year. A pair of brothers find dozens of guns in a Georgia River, and now the question is how they ended up there. Our Latasha Gibbons spoke with the brothers about the mystery attracting a lot of attention on social media. Feels like it's heavy. I went from going, you know, seven, 12 hour work days a week to nothing. Check that out. When Adam Coward was laid off due to the pandemic, he started magnet fishing with his brother Jacob. Holy cow, dude. It's like fishing, but instead of using a rod, they use a lever with a large magnet to pull metal objects from the water. Rebar. It's all documented on their YouTube page, Dirty Mag Yackers. So, you know, we pulled, you know, bicycles and metal, the street signs, lawnmowers, just anything. Newspaper stands. Yeah, newspaper stands. The heaviest thing I pulled out was a 257-pound 1920s gas steam radiator. So far, they've scouted 180 different locations around Georgia, but their most fascinating find was near Athens on the North Oconee River, where their loot could fall in line with rumors of an alleged robbery from years ago. First gun comes out, I just kind of, I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and I called my brother. He come out with me the next day, and I think he found three or four. I found five or six more. Over the course of a few days in these murky waters, they discovered 30 guns. The styles span over decades, including this Tech 9 Uzi. In the beginning, it was more a little bit more modern guns, um, 80s, 90s type pistols, and then it kind of went back to just old revolvers, old like small caliber 22 revolvers. Some are probably even from the 1800s. The Coward brothers are now the talk of many towns all over the state. Overwhelmed with uh, excitement and disbelief of what we found. The magnitude of guns we pulled out was just, it was unbelievable. Athens Clark County Police say their investigators as well as ATF agents will process each gun recovered to find out if any of them are connected to any crime. They also want to point out not only is it dangerous to toss a firearm into a body of water, but it's also illegal. Coming up, a dangerous social media challenge has made its way to Metro Atlanta. What you need to know about the new trend on TikTok. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. I took some Benadryl last night. A new TikTok trend is sending teens to the ER. Teenagers in Georgia are overdosing on Benadryl trying to get high. It's all part of the so-called Benadryl challenge on TikTok. One young person rushed to the ER in Metro Atlanta survived. But a 15 year old in Oklahoma died. John Chirik explains the risk and the danger of a stupid trend all in the name of TikTok. Boredom or peer pressure, foolish adventure, teens and young adults copying TikTok videos showing people guessing how many Benadryl capsules they can take to get high without getting sick. I took some Benadryl last night. But the medicine works so fast, there is no home first aid for an overdose. It can be fatal. People want to take enough medicine to get them to the point of hallucinating. And this is where you're basically playing Russian roulette with dosing. You potentially can die. Dr. Gaylord Lopez of the Georgia Poison Center speaks of the 15 year old in Oklahoma playing the TikTok Benadryl challenge who died of an overdose. Or in Metro Atlanta, where someone took upwards of more than two dozen. Uh, Benadryl capsules to try to get high. That person made it to the ER, nearly died. It can also cause seizures. In Texas, nurse practitioner Amber Jewison treated three teens who OD'd. They wanted to get high and see how it felt because of these videos. It's not the medicine itself that harms them. The dose makes the poison. Doctors say parents who see their child suddenly lethargic, drowsy, incoherent, okay. should beware. It might okay. be from an overdose, from a TikTok Benadryl challenge, a game of Russian roulette reaching homes everywhere. Well, TikTok may be fun for kids, but we know some parents have concerns about the content. There are ways to limit what your child sees. You can search for parental controls to keep your kids safe. Parents can remotely restrict feed content, stop direct messages and limit how much time their child spends on the app by linking their child's account to their own. Coming up next with more and more students heading back into classrooms. Concerns growing, they are bringing home more than just schoolwork. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. 
There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. The back to school question is a thorny one for many, many parents. Should kids be back in a classroom or learn from home? Back and forth, Jennifer, it's been going for a very long time. Yeah, that decision even more difficult in intergenerational households with the virus disproportionately attacking the elderly and often carried silently by the young. Digital producer Jonathan Raymond takes a closer look. I think we are going to just wing it until we can't wing it anymore. <laughs> and I mean, not knowing how long this is going to be a thing, that's why I'm just like, okay, am I going to keep my kid in this little bubble forever? Or what, like, how do we proceed from here? I have no idea what the, the next year is going to look like, but I'm trying to you know, be realistic about it and consider that, you know, he might have to end up in school. Many of the families that we serve have diabetes, hypertension, and other chronic diseases. A lot of the families we serve, they want the children to be back in school. They know that's a great place for the kids. 30% of the grandparents that are program are over age 60 and we have grandparents in their 70s and sometimes in their 80s who are raising grandchildren. So the transmission across generations is a, um, a legitimate concern that they have. If you have a multi-generational household, the, the older people definitely are at the highest risk. You know, and I do have one in my house. My parents live with me, and I have a four and a half year old. I've made the decision to send him to his preschool summer camp. And, you know, I did discuss that with my parents. But having a four and a half year old, it's virtually impossible to make him understand that he needs to be away from his grandparents. He's just not going to do that. But if you have an older child, that may be a conversation you try to have. You know, it's very hard as a parent not to let your emotions come into this, but I think you really need to look at the cases in your area. You need to look at what is your school doing to try to protect your child. Do you think that's sufficient? Do you think it's not sufficient? Have there been cases in the school already? In your community, what's happening? All those factors should go into making that decision. To see more of our interviews for the story, look for it in the As Seen on TV section of the 11 Alive app. Before the pandemic, Atlanta expected a big economic boost to come this weekend, including the Chick-fil-A kickoff games and Dragon Con. Nearly 90,000 people were slated to visit the city for Dragon Con, but for the first time in 34 years, the science fiction, fantasy and pop culture convention is going virtual. As for football, all three Chick-fil-A kickoff games for this year canceled. How does that really affect the bottom line for the city of Atlanta? The Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau says more than $86 million were estimated to pour into the city from Dragon Con. The Chick-fil-A kickoff game previously scheduled for Saturday was expected to bring in $35 million with $30 million estimated to come in from the Labor Day game. Atlanta started the year with 39 conventions on the calendar. Dozens of those citywide conventions canceled because of the pandemic. The total estimated economic impact for those events, $640 million. This November, Republican Senator David Perdue facing John Ossoff, the Democrat, and it is one of the most watched races anywhere in the United States, but we haven't heard a lot from Senator Perdue. 11 Alive's Doug Richards takes a look at why the sounds of silence are by design. By his advertising, you would certainly know that Senator David Perdue is running for re-election, but by his campaign schedule, 
you'd hardly know it at all. Senator David Perdue's office says the senator spent August traveling around the state. They document Perdue's visits with photos in news releases sent out after his events have concluded. Senator David Perdue. Perdue rarely sends out a schedule in advance. When he has, as for this event in April 2017, he sometimes draws noisy protesters. In fact, Caroline Stover is among those who regularly protest outside Purdue's office in Buckhead. I have not met or heard of anyone who's had face-to-face uh, -face time with Senator Purdue. How long have you been trying to see David Purdue? It's been uh, three and a half years. I do it differently. I engage individually and in small groups, and we do a lot of that in this state, as you know. That um, was so Purdue in February 2017, about a month into Donald Trump's presidency. Purdue had become an outspoken supporter of Trump's policies. He drew protesters then. Trump's policies drew protesters this week at events held by Georgia's other Republican Senator, Kelly Loeffler. Unlike Purdue, Loeffler has announced campaign events in advance and encouraged attendance. Loeffler's Twitter site even showed protesters inside another of her events Thursday. Can you blame Senator Purdue for wanting to avoid circumstances like that? If he's afraid of controversy, then he should not be our our representative in Washington, D.C. Senator Perdue continues to be a regular on national cable news shows, particularly Fox News. We asked his office for a comment on the story. We got no response. Traffic has been slow in airports all over the nation, but this coming holiday weekend is expected to see a, a huge ramp up in travelers. This just as the TSA has redesigned their checkpoints to protect passengers and officers. Tom Costello covers aviation for NBC and has details now from Washington's Reagan National Airport. Walking into any airport these days can seem eerie. The pandemic has left concourses, ticket counters and TSA checkpoints virtually empty. The low point came on April 14th when only 87,000 passengers flew nationwide, down from 2.5 million flying each day before the pandemic. Passengers slowly returned over the summer. Today is expected to be the busiest day yet, with 900,000 passengers nationwide. And that one right here? And checkpoints now look a bit different. Plexiglass to separate officers and passengers. Stickers on the floor to keep passengers six feet apart. And new self-service kiosks that check your ID, then match it to your airline ticket record. TSA Chief Admiral David Pekoski. You walk up, you take your credential, and just insert it into the machine right here. They will ask you to bring your mask down. The machine will, will capture an image. You can see it right there on the screen. And then my credential comes out. I take it. No touch between the officer and me. Also rolling out at 434 airports, new software in the full body scanners that reduces the need for pat downs, new antimicrobial bins, and more CT scanners that allow officers to manipulate images of what's inside your carry on bag to verify it's not a threat, reducing the need to do bag checks. If a TSA officer is going to reach into somebody's bag and then they reach into my bag, are they using the same gloves? They will either uh, change the gloves out, and if you ask them if they reach into your bag and if you ask them to change the gloves, they will, um, or they will sanitize the gloves. Officers must also change gloves for every body check. In any way, is security being compromised because of us wearing masks and because of the plexiglass? Yeah, no, it's not being compromised in any way whatsoever. Every single one of these new technology advancements that we have, uh, first and foremost, improves security and improves security a lot. Uh, and then secondarily, as we look at technologies, everything we look at, not only will it improve security, but it will also improve the passenger experience. Despite the pandemic and unexpected development, while passenger volume is down 75%, the ratio of gun confiscations per passenger have tripled and 80% of them are loaded. Most passengers claim they simply forgot the gun was in a bag. But the first offense comes with a federal fine of up to $4,100, plus the possibility of local criminal charges. Yeah, don't forget your gun. That will cost you a lot of money, get you into a lot of trouble. One other note here, face masks. They are required. The TSA requires them. The airport requires them. The airlines require them. The TSA will give you one if you forget yours and you show up without one. But if you try to walk through airports without a mask, airport police may very well escort you out.
Black Restaurant Week kicking off in Atlanta today. Several restaurants to support. It sounds awfully good right now at 837. I am hungry indeed, Jennifer. This year, <laughs> there's a big focus on reviving the black restaurant industry. And Damon Johnson, the owner of Finn and Feathers in Southeast Atlanta, believes business is booming for some owners despite the COVID crisis. The African-American community has rallied around a lot of these black restaurant owners. Why do you think they're doing that? Because now they, they understand the power we have. We work a lot. We, we work hard at what we do. We really passionate about what we do. Come support, you know, and they starting to realize that black restaurants, we do have great service. Black Restaurant Week runs through September 13th for a list of participating restaurants, and there are a lot of them. You can check out the 11 Alive app and click on the As Seen on TV section. For six months, a local woman was stranded thousands of miles away from her family as COVID brought travel to a halt. Today, she is finally back home thanks to some help from 11 Alive's Bill Liss. Last October, Sarah Vick journeyed to Calcutta, India on a film production assignment. She expected to be home in Flowery Branch early in the new year. Then COVID-19 raced across India and the country came to a grinding halt. Borders closed, flights were canceled, people stayed closeted in their homes. And for the next six months, Vic was trapped. She tried everything to get home, but got nowhere. It was just chaotic and it was, it had gotten to the point where it was a bit hopeless. I just felt like I was starting to think I was gonna be in India forever. <laughs> For Fick, getting home was critical. Her mom, Lisa Robbins, is a cancer patient and her brother, Josh, has Down syndrome and autism. When we learned that Sarah was stranded in Calcutta, we immediately reached out to United Airlines executives in Chicago. They wasted no time, and their people in India reached out immediately to Sarah by cell phone, and she was booked on a flight to come home. I am very, very anxious. I feel, I feel so anxious, I feel nauseous. <laughs> and today she arrived. 11 Alive photojournalist Stephen Boise was at Hartsfield Jackson as Sarah reunited with her mom 10 months after leaving Flowery Branch. I didn't foresee being able to come home until whenever the pandemic was over and India opened their borders. So this is, I, I just told her I feel like I had almost started to forget just how much I missed her until I saw her. So just so much thank you and gratitude for it. I feel like I can breathe. <laughs> Happy tears and hugs all around. Sweet Hoping the best story. for that family, yeah. Still ahead in prime time, President Trump on the defense tonight about a canceled trip to honor fallen military members. Money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money? President Trump denies reports he referred to America's deceased military members as quote unquote losers. His Democratic rival Joe Biden says if the reporting is true, the president is unfit to be commander in chief. Alice Barr has the latest from Washington. President Trump forcefully pushing back today against reporting in The Atlantic magazine that he called dead American service members losers and suckers. It was a totally fake story and that was confirmed by many people who were actually there. Uh, it was a terrible thing that somebody could say the kind of things, and especially to me, because I've done more for the military than almost anybody else. The Atlantic article describes a canceled 2018 trip to a U.S. military cemetery in France, citing four people with firsthand knowledge who claim the president said, quote, why should I go to that cemetery? It's filled with losers. Several current and former aides insisting the trip was canceled because rain made it too dangerous to fly. But the language harkens back to President Trump's comments about now deceased Senator John McCain, who survived more than five years as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, whose late son served in Iraq, seizing on the story today. If these statements are true, the president should humbly apologize to every gold star mother and father and every blue star family that he's denigrated and insulted. Who the heck does he think he is? A progressive veterans group out today with a searing ad aimed at the president. My son is not a loser. A broadside against a commander in chief who casts himself as the military's strongest ally. The controversy comes on a day when the White House wanted to promote job gains for the month of August. The unemployment rate dropped to 8.4 percent. Well, here we are. We made it. Finally, a long holiday weekend. And this weekend is going to cooperate with us if you're trying to escape rain. We're not really expecting any rain to move into our area for Saturday, Sunday, and on Monday as well. Here's a look at that long holiday weekend on Saturday. Uh, temperature right around 89 in the afternoon. A, a good bit of sunshine mixing in with just a few clouds at times. Sunday, not as muggy. Now, I want you to know that on Sunday and Monday, we're going to start off the mornings with temperatures dipping down into the 60s. Slightly drier air in place, not as muggy, so it's going to be a nice start with those, you know, slightly cooler temperatures around, but we'll still get up to 87 in the afternoon, but staying below 90, so that's a good thing. Uh, 87 also on Monday, nice conditions, that lower humidity around too. The average high for this time of year is 86, so we'll be just a little bit above the average. So here's a look at the almanac for today. You can see it was hot. We got up to 92. Our low this morning was 74, so both of these temperatures are above average. We should see highs around 86 for this time of year and we should have lows around 69 for this time of year, but we will be seeing those cooler temperatures in the mornings getting closer to average as we go into Sunday, Monday and into much of next week as well. No rain officially at Hartsfield Jackson today. Nobody got rain here in North Georgia except for far North Georgia. Just a couple of spotty showers. We're about a little more than 13 and a half inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. So here's a look at your weather headlines. We're going to see a dry holiday weekend looking pretty good with those temperatures generally in the mid and upper 80s, but we will see some rain that will be returning once we get into next week. So here's the forecast for your Saturday starting off at 71. We get up to 89 in the afternoon on our scale from 1 to 11, where at 11 is a perfect day. We're going with a 10 
a lot of sunshine in the afternoon. Just a couple of clouds will start mixing in with that sun. Now here's the evening forecast for you. We are watching that weak system coming into North Georgia with a limited moisture, maybe just a couple of spotty showers there, but that all falls apart as it gets closer to us. I'm not expecting any rain here in Atlanta, just a couple of clouds around. And then on Saturday morning, a beautiful start to the day with mostly sunny skies. Lunchtime still mostly sunny in the afternoon, sunshine and just a couple of clouds mixing in, but it looks like we'll be rain free. So a nice start to your weekend on Saturday. Then on Sunday, we will still see dry conditions, maybe a couple of clouds in the afternoon on Sunday. Again, not really concerned about any rain that's going to be moving our way. Let me take you out uh, to show you the tropics. Omar falling apart. It's going to become a tropical uh, depression, and then we will no longer have any advisories on this system from the National Hurricane Center. And of course, we'll be watching those other systems out in the Atlantic. We'll talk more about that in our next hour here on 11 Alive News Prime Time. 89 degrees for a high on Saturday, a 10 on the wasometer. Tens again Sunday and Monday. Again, the cool mornings, cooler mornings, I should say, with temperatures in the 60s to start. Highs around 87. And then Tuesday, a few more clouds, a 20% chance for a shower late in the day. And then a 40% chance for showers Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday with highs generally holding there in the mid 80s. The pandemic has hit so many Americans in so many ways, from lost work to contracting COVID-19 to losing loved ones. But when all three happened to one Jonesboro woman, she didn't give up. She gave back. Here's Cheryl Prehunt. It's just something that we do. We love to serve. Taisha Alexander has always had a heart to help. For 12 years, she did that in classrooms as an elementary school computer teacher at Griffin Spalding County Schools. In March, she says she was told to make lesson plans for at-home teaching. The district was only expecting to do virtual learning for two weeks. I wasn't thinking that it was that serious at the time, but once it hit home, Days later, Taisha's brother-in-law tested positive for COVID-19. The same day he died from complications, Taisha tested positive for the virus too. They were among the first cases reported in Metro Atlanta. I got a lot of backlash from it, people saying mean and hurtful things. Taisha recovered and her experience compelled her to help more. She knew there was important work to do. I just couldn't sit back and not pursue this opportunity to where I could help someone who needed my help. She went to work with Care Atlanta Food Bank and volunteered extra time delivering food to the elderly and low income families during the pandemic. It's nothing like being able to help someone. It, it gives you a feeling that's indescribable. Taisha says there is no shame in asking for support because she's been there too. I know what it feels like to be in isolation to not be able to do for yourself, to not be able to go out. You know, we never know. It could be them today and me tomorrow, and I'm going to want somebody to help me. Taisha is back teaching her students virtually, something she says she supports after her own experience with COVID. Mailboxes wrapped in plastic, people reaching out to us asking what's going on. We've got answers next in primetime. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. 
There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Two mailboxes wrapped in plastic catching the eyes of customers and passerbys. The two mailboxes are outside the post office on Fulton Industrial Boulevard. We reached out to the U.S. Postal Service to find out why they are wrapped and what customers should do in the meantime. The USPS sent us this statement saying the collection boxes are out of service because of a broken lock. Customers can still drop off mail inside the post office until the boxes are fixed. If you believe there is a problem with your mail, you can call the USPS Inspection Services and they will help you out. Ahead on prime time, a milestone for those who serve our country, why our military members have proven to be particularly vulnerable to COVID. And we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside?
a fun day on a lake took a dangerous turn. A New York man believes it was divine intervention that saved him. Jimmy McDonald's kayak overturned and he was in trouble, but that's when priests on a party boat stepped in. Here's Mark Mulholland. It was a choppy afternoon in Lake George. Jimmy McDonald, a drug counselor from Albany, went out in rented kayaks with his wife and stepkids. He went off in his own direction as he was taking pictures and not paying attention. Soon, he toppled the kayak and was in trouble, refusing at first to yell for help. My pride and ego told me I'll figure this out. But he couldn't right the boat, and with his life jacket sliding up over his head, he was getting exhausted trying to hang on. You know, that's when I said, all right, I, I think I might die today. I think this, this might be it. But he prayed to God, as he often does, especially in the seven years he's been sober. Then I look out of the corner of my eye and I see, you know, Greg in the tiki bar, and they said, do you need help? And I said, yes, please, please. At that point, I was begging for help. Greg is Greg Barrett, a captain of the Tiki tour boat. He says Jimmy was hanging on for dear life. I, I definitely do believe it was a, a bit of a divine intervention. And here's why. The passengers that day weren't partiers. They were priests and seminarians from the Paulist Fathers Retreat on Lake George. McDonald, a recovering addict, prays for help, and it arrives in the form of priests on a floating bar. How funny is it that, um, you know, I've been sober for seven years and I get saved by a tiki bar. The priests and seminarians who are on board have no doubt that a higher power played a role in them being exactly where Jimmy needed them. For us that day, that was our mission, to be, to be present to and to help someone in need. Jimmy compares the whole ordeal to his days of addiction. Asking for help sooner would have been a good idea instead of waiting till it nearly cost me my life. Tonight on Primetime, fast-moving thieves leaving a family business in shatters for the second time in just months. Plus, a dangerous new TikTok challenge already proving deadly, and it involves something you probably have in your medicine cabinet. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Well, welcome to prime time on this Friday evening as we head into the Labor Day, a long Labor Day weekend. Well, it's the unofficial end of summer and a lot of folks plan to get together, Natisha. Yeah, of course, but we remain in a pandemic. So Governor Brian Kemp traveled around the state today warning Georgians not to let their guard down when it comes to COVID safety. This progress can be erased very quickly if we grow complacent and ignore the guidance and public safety measures that we have in place. The governor continuing to spread his message to do four simple things to help fight the coronavirus. Wear a mask, stay socially distant, wash your hands, and follow public health guidelines. And important precautions as COVID-19 cases continue to rise. The numbers include some of our student athletes forcing several games around the metro to be canceled as Team 1-1 kicks off tonight. Maria Martin reports on some of the changes fans can expect to see this season. High school football is back. Just talk about the excitement around the fact that we are going to have some games out there on the field. I think everybody is so excited to see it back. And, you know, I, I think, you know, when you see watch the Corky Kell games and, you know, you see the excitement in there, people are like, okay, this is really going to happen. Look, there's been a lot of hard work. You know better than anybody that there is a lot that goes into putting on high school football in the middle of a pandemic. Let's talk about what that hard work has looked like in every one of the GHSA, their effort to get to the point where we are now. I think, it, you know, I think the easiest way to kind of sum it up is that, you know, we're doing the things that we have always taken for granted. And when you start thinking about the social distancing in the crowd or the capacity limits, you know, a lot of people are coming in at 25% capacity, 30% capacity, and then you've got to figure out what that looks like because you want to make sure that the parents can be there. I'm glad that you brought up safety because that's really paramount. The GHSA, they put those policies in place, but you know, every school is different. They're kind of under their own guidelines. Why put it that way? It, it's not a one size fits all. And you know, everybody's got a different size stadium. You've got a different layout. You know, COVID-19 has impacted that community in different ways. And so, so there was no way just to say, hey, here's a blanket statement that everybody's gonna have to abide by. You've gotta provide good guidance at the high level and then make sure that your ADs and their staff and their coaches can solve for all those little things. 
11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks, and we're hearing from a lot of folks out there concerning high school football. Some people are against it, some people are for it. Here's what a medical expert had to say about all that. When they're at practice and they're in their bubble, if you don't have COVID virus on your football team, you can't spread what you don't have. Tonight at 11, we're going to verify whether high school football players are more likely to contract COVID-19 compared to other high school sports. That's on Up Late at 11, right before Team 1-1. And it's dry for most of those football games out there tonight. You know, we were telling you last night about this weak system that's going to be coming in from Tennessee and North Carolina with very limited moisture with it. Well, it is moving into North Georgia, and there are just a couple little showers around. In fact, we have one of these right here that just came through Floyd County with some moderate rain uh, near the near Rome, actually south of Rome now, and that's trying to move into the southwestern parts of Bartow County, northern parts of Paulding County. A few other little isolated showers. In fact, this one just trying to move into North Fulton right here. But these are weakening as they're moving in, and that's what we we're expecting to happen is that these would be a lot weaker as they push into our area. If you get hit by one of these showers, it's going to be light. It's not going to last long at all as these are all going to be falling apart. You can see how they're uh, in association with those showers now that are in parts of North Carolina and through Tennessee. And then once this sweeps through, we're going to have some drier air that's going to be filtering into our area as we head into the weekend. And temperatures trending down, not a lot, but at least just a little bit. Take a look out there right now. Let me show you uh, what we're watching. This is our camera in Rome, a live look, and the roads are dry. You know, we just had some showers near Rome and in the southern parts of Floyd County a little while ago, but any of those showers out there are not widespread at all. Now, let me tell you what's going to happen after this system moves through. I mentioned the drier air for the weekend, and I mean more than just no rain. The humidity levels are going to go down too. Here's a look at the dew points. That's the real measure of how much moisture is in the atmosphere. And when you have dew points in the 70s, it's that oppressive, muggy conditions that we have. Today we had dew points in the 60s, still humid. Tomorrow it'll be in the lower 60s and then upper 50s to near 60 for Sunday and Monday. So not only no rain, but also feeling a little less humid and a little less muggy. And then we'll watch those humidity levels coming back up Wednesday and Thursday, and that's going to correspond with a higher rain chance moving back into our area. Stay with us. We'll break that down for you coming up in just a few minutes. All right, Chris, we'll see you in a few minutes. After days of watching our COVID cases trend downward, the curve appears to have stalled. Take a look at this graph here. Today, the Department of Public Health reported more than 2,000 new positive test results. That's more than four times higher than the number of cases we had going into Memorial Day. With fewer people are having serious complications from the virus, hospitals reported about 1,700 people are still receiving care. One reason for a drop in hospitalizations is the age of the people who are getting sick. Young adults between the ages of 18 and 29 make up 25% of all positive cases in Georgia and more than a third or 37% of all cases this past week. While they are less likely to get seriously ill, 1,682 have had to go to the hospital for treatment and 48 have died. Those numbers are part of the reason students leaving Georgia college campuses for Labor Day are worried that they may not be able to return. Caitlin Ross spoke to Georgia Tech students about their concerns. Students aren't the only ones concerned. Colleges across Georgia sent out alerts to their populations over this past week, warning students to be careful, wear masks and socially distance over the Labor Day holiday. But will that be enough? Students on Georgia Tech's campus say they're worried after 39 new cases were reported yesterday alone. They say the school has been inconsistent in its messaging about housing, first telling students who share a room they would have to move out, then backing down and calling the moves voluntary. In an email sent to parents, administrators said their campus testing surveillance program indicated there was a high spread among roommates, but said it's ultimately up to each family whether their student remains in a double occupancy room. Because logistically, there are so many moving parts and I feel like we keep being told how difficult it is and how many things they're doing to make sure the situation is safe. But there was a very easy way for them to make the situation safe before all of this happened. That would have, um, I think, made it easier for them to have a, a good online class experience at the very least, whereas now we're on campus and I don't think anybody is very happy right now. Fourth year student Kelly O'Neill worries if the COVID-19 infection rate gets any higher, students will be forced to go fully virtual, even though most of them are already taking a majority of their classes online. And a spokesperson for Georgia Tech says they are testing 2,000 people a day for COVID-19 as part of their voluntary surveillance program. 
You know, the latest census data shows there are 18.6 million military veterans in the United States, and the majority of them over the age of 60, and in the coronavirus high-risk group as well. Today, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs is reporting a somber milestone here, more than 3,000 deaths from COVID-19. More than 53,000 veterans and VA employees have contracted the virus. And of that number, there are almost 3,000 active cases. Here in Georgia, the VA reports 82 veterans have died from COVID-19, and there are currently 131 active cases. And nearly 2,000 veterans and VA employees are recovering from the virus. Now, Georgia is the fastest growing state in the country when it comes to veterans. This is according to the U.S. Uh, the US Secretary of Veteran Affairs, Robert Wilkie. He visited the Atlanta VA administration today. Uh, getting an update from the director, Ann Brown, on the impacts of the coronavirus. Secretary Wilkie spoke about the ways the facility has adapted to help more veterans during this pandemic. In a normal month, Atlanta VA conducts 950 telehealth appointments. During the pandemic, that number has gone to 20,000. That means we're reaching veterans where they live. Secretary Wilkie did not address the ongoing concerns about adequate protective equipment for VA workers. Some nurses rallied, nurses, nurses rallied outside the Atlanta VA Medical Center back in April complaining that the, the lack of masks and other supplies put them at risk. And last month, a report obtained by Kaiser Health News showed Georgia was facing a substantial shortage here of PPE at the same time Governor Brian Kemp began lifting pandemic restrictions. You're going to find more on that report as well as a daily breakdown of Georgia's coronavirus numbers in our 11 Alive app. And we have a special section dedicated to bring you facts, not fear, about the pandemic. The Georgia Department of Natural Resources mourning the loss of a veteran captain killed when he was hit by a car while on duty. According to the Georgia State Patrol, Captain Stanley Elrod was hit by a driver of a Chevy Cobalt last night in Madison County. This afternoon, the DNR tweeted their condolences to Elrod's family, saying he made everyone better through his actions. Governor Kemp also offering his sympathy to the family. I hope all Georgians will join Marty, the girls, and I in keeping the Elrod family in your thoughts and prayers. Elrod had been with the DNR for 28 years. The driver in that wreck has been arrested and is now facing several charges. A cafe in Midtown vandalized once again, not once, but twice. The owner took his frustrations to social media because he couldn't believe what happened next. 11 Alive Brittany Kleinpeter shares his story. I was angry. I mean, I'll own it. I'm a person. Known for its outdoor garden with a living koi pond and a fountain, Babs Midtown brings people from around Atlanta to dine on the patio. Last week, the owner, Randy Adler, says vandals hit the garden. It was just random vandalism. I think all this added polarization has whipped up a frenzy of hate no matter what. And people act out destroying beautiful things. Adler dedicated a part of the garden in his mother's honor after he lost her to COVID-19 earlier this year. He wrote in a Facebook post the flowers he planted in his mother's remembrance were destroyed. Sculptures broken and trash thrown in the fountain. So I just kind of, you know, kind of let it come out. And then the next day we had people in the neighborhood walk by dropping off cash, plants. We had groups offering, you know, what can we help you clean up and do? Adler's post was shared hundreds of times. It was crazy. Like, they sent us pictures of their children eating lunch. They sent us memories. I mean, you know, it's my business and I love it. We've been here a while, but we didn't, I didn't really realize how attached people are to the restaurant. The garden is now cleaned up and reopened with the help of the community. When we bleed, they bleed. When we cry, they cry. When we feel victimized, they feel victimized. We have so many people that feel so safe here. Adler shared with me that he wasn't able to find the same flowers that he had planted in his mother's honor locally, but that a customer drove 60 miles to find the flowers, bring them back, and donate them. They had two Georgia brothers reel in dozens of guns from one river. Now investigators are fishing for answers. And of course, don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break.
clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20. New video tonight showing thieves hitting a Buckhead jewelry store for the second time this year. The owner telling 11 Alive's Joe Hinkey that it's too much for them to bear after vandals looted the store back in May, right at the height of the protest when it turned violent. After the first break in back in May at a state jewelers behind me here in Buckhead, the owners tell me they spent several months cleaning up all the damage and restocking their inventory. They were almost back to business as normal. And then last night it happened all over again. At 12.45 this morning, surveillance video shows three people breaking into a state jewelers. They shattered the display cases, loaded up a box with jewelry, broke into the back of the store, but the owners say the thieves cannot open the safe. Timestamps show after one minute and 51 seconds, the trio takes off. Eight minutes later, an Atlanta police car drives up. Watching the video, Ala Isakov says is heartbreaking. Her family owns the state jewelers. Isakov says they are still adding up the stolen jewelry and damages, but it will be in the tens of thousands of dollars. It's just a mess. It's sad. It's glass everywhere. It's still a little shaken. Um, we're trying to recover from the last break in, and then we, we walk into this again. Walking into this again, this video from May 30th shows around a dozen people breaking in. A night of protests over racial injustice in downtown Atlanta turned violent, and people looted stores from downtown to Buckhead. Isaacov says the damage and stolen property totaled $90,000, and so far police have not given them any updates on the investigation. This night in May temporarily closed the business. We were just trying to clean up, so we just finally set up again and then restored all the showcases and set it up to where we can be functional again, just to start from the beginning. Now today they're cleaning up again. Whether any of the same people from the May break-in broken again last night is unknown. They had masks on, they had gloves on, and you can't even see their faces, so it's hard to tell. Atlanta police tonight needing help solving both break-ins. Anyone with information is asked to contact APD. Well, we're still watching that weak system with limited moisture that is moving through northwest and north Georgia right now, and there are only just a couple little showers around. This is what we were talking about yesterday with a really low rain chance over parts of north Georgia, and that's this is all that's really left of that system right now. And there are a couple of spotty showers. You can see them coming in, pushing down toward the south and to the east. This one has was moving near Rome. It's in the southern parts of Floyd County, trying to move into the northern parts of Polk County, southwestern areas of Bartow County. I I think it's going to be falling apart as it moves into the northern parts of Paulding County as well. Just a little bit of moderate rain in association with that right on the Floyd, Polk and Bartow County line. And again, that's moving down uh, to the south and to the east. A little bit of light rain here just trying to move into North Fulton coming out of Cherokee County. That's all part of that same system that is falling apart. And you can see that's in association with that area of rain that we were watching earlier tonight in Tennessee moving into North Carolina. 
We are expecting it to weaken. That's exactly what's happening right now as those showers fall apart. I don't think we'll see any of that making it inside the perimeter here uh, within the next little while. We, sh we will stay dry here in our area. Take a live look out there right now. This is our tower cam uh, that we have up in the Athens area where you can see that the streets are dry in Athens. Nice night, but it is kind of mild out there tonight. We've got a lot of temperatures that are still holding in the 80s in a lot of spots. In fact, we're at 83 here. Athens, you're also at 80. Eatonton's 84. 80s also in Duluth, Marietta, Can Canton, Gainesville, Rome, and Dalton, but we have some 70s southwest of the city, and then those 70s up in North Georgia too in Blairsville and in Clayton. Now we're going to watch these temperatures falling as we continue through the rest of the uh, late night hours. We'll be at about 79 at midnight, and then into the lower 70s here by tomorrow morning. It's going to be a nice sunny start, and it will be on the mild side, uh, and then we warm up pretty quickly during the day tomorrow, getting up to about 89. Today's high was 92. So we'll be a little bit lower tomorrow. I think we'll stay just shy of the 90 degree mark and in celebration of staying below 90 with mostly sunny skies, a dry holiday weekend. We're going with a 10 on the wasometer, not quite an 11 just because this is still above the average, but it was really a, a nice day out there. Take a look at the forecast track and you can see that area that we're watching here falling apart. Then tomorrow we start off with plenty of sunshine around. It's going to be dry lunchtime, mostly sunny, partly cloudy in the afternoon. There might be just a couple little clouds around mixing in with the sunshine, but they won't be the rain producers. And then on Sunday it is going to be dry once again with uh, nice weather conditions in the morning at lunchtime and then in the afternoon. And that is going to persist also into Monday for your Labor Day holiday with dry weather conditions there too. We're also still keeping an eye on the tropics here. Um, you know, um, we have that one system that's up to the north uh, that is falling apart. And now we have a, a few other systems that we're watching here in the Atlantic. This one here only has a 20 to 30 percent chance of developing, but this one that is in red here has a 40 to 80 percent chance of developing over the next five days. That's the one that we were watching come up, coming off the coast of Africa as it gets into this red development zone here. We'll see a better chance that it'll develop. And then also another system coming off the coast of Africa when it moves into this area, it's going to have about a 60 percent chance of development over the next five days. It's the active time. Typically, the peak of hurricane season is September 10th. So here's what we're watching tomorrow. Tens on the wasometer for Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. High around 89 Saturday. Look at the low temperature Sunday and Monday morning in the 60s with that drier air in place. Going to feel pretty comfortable there with highs only around 87. Back to a 20% chance for a shower late Tuesday. Then a 40% chance Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday with high temperatures around 86, 87 degrees. A pair of brothers find dozens of guns in a Georgia river, and now the question is, how did they end up there? Latasha Givens spoke to the brothers about the mystery attracting a lot of attention on social media. Feels like it's heavy. I went from going, you know, seven, 12 hour work days a week to nothing. Check that out. When Adam Coward was laid off due to the pandemic, he started magnet fishing with his brother Jacob. Holy cow, dude. It's like fishing, but instead of using a rod, they use a lever with a large magnet to pull metal objects from the water. Rebar. It's all documented on their YouTube page, Dirty Mag Yackers. So, you know, we pulled, you know, bicycles and metal, the street signs, lawnmowers, just anything. Newspaper stands. Yeah, newspaper stands. The heaviest thing I pulled out was a 257-pound 1920s gas steam radiator. So far, they've scouted 180 different locations around Georgia, but their most fascinating find was near Athens on the North Oconee River, where their loot could fall in line with rumors of an alleged robbery from years ago. First gun comes out, I just kind of, I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and I called my brother. He come out with me the next day, and I think he found three or four. I found five or six more. Over the course of a few days in these murky waters, they discovered 30 guns. The styles span over decades, including this Tech 9 Uzi. In the beginning, it was more a little bit more modern guns, um, 80s, 90s type pistols, and then it kind of went back to just old revolvers, old like small caliber 22 revolvers. Some are probably even from the 1800s. The Coward brothers are now the talk of many towns all over the state. Overwhelmed with uh, excitement and disbelief of what we found. The magnitude of guns we pulled out was just, it was unbelievable. Athens Clark County Police say their investigators as well as ATF agents will process each gun recovered to find out if any of them are connected to any crime. They also want to point out not only is it dangerous to toss a firearm into a body of water, but it's also illegal. 
Coming up, a dangerous social media challenge has made its way to Metro Atlanta. What you need to know about this new trend on TikTok. Had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. I took some Benadryl last night. A new TikTok trend is sending teens to the ER. Teenagers in Georgia are overdosing on Benadryl, trying to get high. It's all part of the so-called Benadryl challenge on TikTok. One young person rushed to the ER in Metro Atlanta survived. But a 15-year-old in Oklahoma died. John Sherrick explains the risk and the dangers of this new trend, all in the name of becoming TikTok famous. Boredom or peer pressure, foolish adventure, teens and young adults copying TikTok videos showing people guessing how many Benadryl capsules they can take to get high without getting sick. I took some Benadryl last night. But the medicine works so fast, there is no home first aid for an overdose. It can be fatal. People want to take enough medicine to get them to the point of hallucinating. And this is where you're basically playing Russian roulette with dosing, you potentially can die. Dr. Gaylord Lopez of the Georgia Poison Center speaks of the 15-year-old in Oklahoma playing the TikTok Benadryl challenge who died of an overdose, or in Metro Atlanta. Where someone took upwards of more than two dozen uh, Benadryl capsules to try to get high. That person made it to the ER, nearly died. It can also cause seizures. In Texas, nurse practitioner Amber Jewison treated three teens who OD'd. They wanted to get high and see how it felt because of these videos. It's not the medicine itself that harms them. The dose makes the poison. Doctors say parents who see their child suddenly lethargic, drowsy, incoherent, okay. should beware. It might okay. be from an overdose, from a TikTok Benadryl challenge, a game of Russian roulette reaching homes everywhere you know TikTok may be fun for a lot of kids out there but we know some parents have concerns about the content on that app there are ways to limit what your kids can actually see just search for the parental controls to keep your children safe parents can actually remotely restrict feed content stop direct messages and limit how much time their child spends on the app by linking their children's account with their own 
Next, with more and more students heading back into classrooms, concerns are growing. They're bringing home more than just their schoolwork. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You know, Natisha, the back to school question is difficult for a lot of parents out there. Should kids be back in the classroom or learn from home? Yeah, it's a tough decision and even more difficult in the intergenerational households with the virus disproportionately attacking the elderly and often carried silently by the young. Digital producer Jonathan Raymond takes a closer look for us. Yeah, I think we are going to just wing it until we can't wing it anymore. <laughs> And I mean, not knowing how long this is going to be a thing, that's why I'm just like, okay, am I going to keep my kid in this little bubble forever? Or what, like, how do we proceed from here? I have no idea what the, the next year is going to look like, but I'm trying to, you know, be realistic about it and consider that, you know, he might have to end up in school. Many of the families that we serve have diabetes, hypertension, and other chronic diseases. A lot of the families we serve, they want the children to be back in school. They know that's a great place for the kids. 30% of the grandparents in our program are over age 60, and we have grandparents in their 70s, and sometimes in their 80s who are raising grandchildren. So the transmission across generations is a, um, a legitimate concern that they have. If you have a multi-generational household, the, the older people definitely are at the highest risk. 
you know, and I do have one in my house. My parents live with me, and I have a four and a half year old. I've made the decision to send him to his preschool summer camp, and you know, I did discuss that with my parents. But having a four and a half year old, it's virtually impossible to make him understand that he needs to be away from his grandparents. He's just not going to do that. But if you have an older child, that may be a conversation you try to have. You know, it's very hard as a parent not to let your emotions come into this, but I think you really need to look at the cases in your area. You need to look at what is your school doing to try to protect your child. Do you think that's sufficient? Do you think it's not sufficient? Have there been cases in the school already? In your community, what's happening? All those factors should go into making that decision. Well, to see more of our interviews from this story, look for it in the Ask Seen on TV section of the 11 Alive app. Before the pandemic, Atlanta expected a big economic boost this weekend, including the Chick-fil-A kickoff games and the Dragon Con. Nearly 90,000 people were slated to visit Atlanta for Dragon Con, but for the first time in 34 years, the science fiction, fantasy, and pop culture convention is now going virtual. As for football, all three Chick-fil-A kickoff games for this year canceled. But how does that really affect the city's bottom line? Well, the Atlanta uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau says more than $86 million were estimated to pour into the city from Dragon Con. The Chick-fil-A kickoff games, previously scheduled for Saturday, was expected to bring in $35 million, with $30 million estimated to come in from the Labor Day games. Now, Atlanta started the, uh, started the year with 39 conventions on the calendar. Dozens of those citywide conventions canceled, of course, because of the pandemic. The total estimated economic impact for those events, $640 million. We're watching that weak system with very limited moisture that's moving through north and west Georgia right now with just a little bit of rain. Now, most of this is falling apart, but you can see we have this one bit that's still holding together coming out of Floyd County into the northern parts of Polk County, southern parts of Bartow County, trying to get into the northern parts of Paulding County. It does have a little bit of moderate rain with it right there at Taylorsville, uh, stretching over to Cartersville, just a few sprinkles over over towards 75, really close to Alatoona Lake. But if you're under that shadow, or just know it's not going to last very long at all. It's not a storm. It's not severe or anything like that is just going to weaken as it moves on over to the east. In fact, we were watching one a minute ago that was coming into northern parts of, uh, of Fulton County, North Fulton, and that has already fallen apart too. And we think the same thing is going to happen with this one over to the west of us. And you can see here some of these showers up in the North Carolina mountains. We're getting a lot of um, false echoes here on radar tonight. So not all of this green that is showing up here is actual rain. Most of those are false echoes out there. And then and once this sweeps through, we're going to have some even drier air that'll move in as we head into the weekend. And that not only means no rain, but it also means lower relative humidity with some drier air in place. Here's a live look uh, and uh, Coweta County looking at the courthouse where it is a nice night there, but still on the mild side over the next 12 hours. Here's what we're watching. Temperatures uh, are going to be falling from those 80s into the 70s during the overnight hours and by tomorrow morning starting off in the city, lower 70s, but outside the city will have some 60s around as that drier air starts to move in. It's going to be a really nice start to the day. It's going to be a nice end to the day as well. But will it be a nice end to the long holiday weekend? We'll break down that seven day outlook for you coming up. All right, Chris, we'll see you in a couple of minutes, sir. Well, this November, Republican Senator, Republican Senator David Perdue is going to be facing off against Democrat John Ossoff, and it's one of the most important elections on the ballot. But we haven't heard a lot from Perdue. 11 Alive's Doug Richards takes a look at why the silence may be by design. By his advertising, you would certainly know that Senator David Perdue is running for re-election. But by his campaign schedule, you'd hardly know it at all. Senator David Perdue's office says the senator spent August traveling around the state. They document Perdue's visits with photos in news releases sent out after his events have concluded. Senator David Perdue. Perdue rarely sends out a schedule in advance. When he has, as for this event in April 2017, he sometimes draws noisy protesters. In fact, Caroline Stover is among those who regularly protest outside Purdue's office in Buckhead. I have not met or heard of anyone who's had face-to-face uh, -face time with Senator Purdue. How long have you been trying to see David Purdue? 
It's been uh, three and a half years. I do it differently. I engage individually and in small groups, and we do a lot of that in this state, as you know. Um, that was so Purdue in February 2017, about a month into Donald Trump's presidency. Purdue had become an outspoken supporter of Trump's policies. He drew protesters then. Trump's policies drew protesters this week at events held by Georgia's other Republican Senator, Kelly Loeffler. Unlike Purdue, Loeffler has announced campaign events in advance and encouraged attendance. Loeffler's Twitter site even showed protesters inside another of her events Thursday. Can you blame Senator Purdue for wanting to avoid circumstances like that? If he's afraid of controversy, then he should not be our our representative in Washington, D.C. Senator Perdue continues to be a regular on national cable news shows, particularly Fox News. We asked his office for a comment on the story. We got no response. Black Restaurant Week kicks off today, and there are several mouth-watering restaurants to support while also satisfying your taste buds. So this year, there's a big focus on reviving the black restaurant industry. Damon Johnson, who is the owner of Finn and Feathers in Southeast Atlanta, believes business is booming for some owners despite the COVID crisis. The African-American community has rallied around a lot of these black restaurant owners. Why do you think they're doing that? Because now they, they understand the power we have. We work a lot. We, we work hard at what we do. We really passionate about what we do. Come support, you know, and they starting to realize that black restaurants, we do have great service. Black Restaurant Week runs through September 13th. And for a list of participating restaurants, go to the 11 Alive app and click on the Ask Seen on TV section. For six months, a local woman who was stranded thousands of miles away from her family as COVID brought travel to a screaming halt. Well, today, she's finally back home, thanks to some help from 11 Alive's Bill Liss. Last October, Sarah Vick journeyed to Calcutta, India on a film production assignment. She expected to be home in Flowery Branch early in the new year. Then COVID-19 raced across India and the country came to a grinding halt. Borders closed, flights were canceled, people stayed closeted in their homes. And for the next six months, Vic was trapped. She tried everything to get home, but got nowhere. It was just chaotic and it was, it had gotten to the point where it was a bit hopeless. I just felt like I was starting to think I was gonna be in India forever. <laughs> For Fick, getting home was critical. Her mom, Lisa Robbins, is a cancer patient and her brother, Josh, has Down syndrome and autism. When we learned that Sarah was stranded in Calcutta, we immediately reached out to United Airlines executives in Chicago. They wasted no time, and their people in India reached out immediately to Sarah by cell phone, and she was booked on a flight to come home. I am very, very anxious. I feel, I feel so anxious, I feel nauseous. <laughs> and today she arrived. 11 Alive photojournalist Stephen Boise was at Hartsfield Jackson as Sarah reunited with her mom 10 months after leaving Flowery Branch. I didn't foresee being able to come home until whenever the pandemic was over and India opened their borders. So this is, I, I just told her I feel like I had almost started to forget just how much I missed her until I saw her. So just so much thank you and gratitude for it. I feel like I can breathe. <laughs> Still to come, a teacher dealing with personal pain and loss from COVID finds healing and helping others. We have her story when we come back. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. President Trump is denying reports that he referred to America's deceased military members as losers. His Democratic rival, Joe Biden, says if the reporting is true, the president is unfit to be commander in chief. Alice Barr has the latest from Washington. President Trump forcefully pushing back today against reporting in the Atlantic magazine that he called dead American service members losers and suckers. It was a totally fake story. And that was confirmed by many people who were actually there. Uh, it was a terrible thing that somebody could say the kind of things, and especially to me, because I've done more for the military than almost anybody else. The Atlantic article describes a canceled 2018 trip to a U.S. military cemetery in France, citing four people with firsthand knowledge who claim the president said, quote, why should I go to that cemetery? It's filled with losers. Several current and former aides insisting the trip was canceled because rain made it too dangerous to fly. But the language harkens back to President Trump's comments about now deceased Senator John McCain, who survived more than five years as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, whose late son served in Iraq, seizing on the story today. If these statements are true, the president should humbly apologize to every gold star mother and father and every blue star family that he's denigrated and insulted. Who the heck does he think he is? A progressive veterans group out today with a searing ad aimed at the president. My son is not a loser. A broadside against a commander in chief who casts himself as the military's strongest ally. You know, this controversy comes on a day when the White House wanted to promote job gains for the month of August. The unemployment rate dropped to 8.4 percent. Two mailboxes wrapped in plastic catching the eyes of customers and passersby. The two mailboxes are outside the post office on Fulton Industrial Boulevard, and we reached out to the U.S. Postal Service to find out why they're wrapped and what customers should do in the meantime. The USPS sent us this statement saying the collection of boxes are out of service because of a broken lock. Customers can still drop off mail inside the post office until the boxes are fixed. 
Well, if you believe there is a problem with your mail, you can call the USPS Inspection Services. We have a number right there on your screen, and they say they will help you out. We continue to watch that weak system with very limited moisture that's moving through North Georgia right now, and we're getting a lot of false echoes on radar tonight, so ignore most of this green that you see on here. This is the one lone cell that we have right now that has just a little bit of light rain and a little pocket of moderate rain right here that's on the, the uh, Cherokee County line or Bartow County line and into the Paulding County line right here that is a little bit moderate just to the south of Cartersville, getting closer to Alatoona Lake. So if you have any friends there on the lake right now, now camping, uh, they may get just a little bit wet. It's not going to last a long time. It's not going to be a lot of heavy rain. In fact, we had a shower that was coming into North Fulton a little while ago that has already fallen apart, and we expect this one to fall apart as well. And that's all part of that that was moving through uh, Tennessee and North Carolina, and we were talking about it weakening as it moves in tonight, and that's exactly what's happening out there right now. And once this pushes through, it's going to reinforce some drier air in place in our area. Some of those showers moved through Floyd County a little bit earlier. This is a live look in Rome and the roads are dry in downtown. It really didn't impact a lot of people, just a few folks on the south side of Floyd County, and that's what's moving through uh, Bartow and into Paulding County as well. So the air is still kind of moist here right now. Even though we haven't had any showers around, it's been pretty humid. This is our moisture map where you see the uh, yellows here. That's when it starts getting a little more moist. And then where you see the oranges and, and red colors like down in Florida, that's where the humidity levels and the moisture content in the air is a lot higher. Where you see the blue, that's where it's kind of dry. And, and that's what's going to be moving our way. See this reinforcing shot of drier air moving our way. Now over to the east, still kind of humid, but the drier air comes into North Georgia. And then that filters in here for Sunday as well. So on Sunday, not only are we not going to have rain around, but the relative humidity levels are going to be a lot lower. And that's going to give us a nicer feel to the air with high temperatures. That'll be in the mid 80s on Sunday and lower humidity. That's not going to feel too bad. And with this lower humidity around and the lower dew points in the morning times on Sunday and Monday, our temperatures will drop a little bit more into the 60s. And then on Monday, it's still going to be dry here. But then notice on Tuesday, another dry day, but this moisture starting to build back in. And once we get into Wednesday and then especially Thursday and Friday with this moisture content higher in the air, that's when we're going to reintroduce those showers moving back into our area. It got hot today. 92 was the high. Above the average, we should be around 86 for this time of year, and it was a really mild start this morning too. at 74. We should start off at 69 and still watching that rain surplus shrinking a little bit because we haven't had any rain in the past couple of days, but still we have a lot of a surplus here. 13.61 inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. All right, let's check out the weather headlines. We're going to have that dry holiday weekend and again, not only no rain, but also the humidity level starting to come down too, and high temperatures still warm. Our average high for this time of year is 86 degrees. We'll be at about 89, so it's still going to be a little bit above the average, but at least we think we're going to get a break in the 90s for the next few days, and then that rain is going to be returning to our forecast once we get into next week. So here's the forecast for your Saturday. On our scale from 1 to 11, where at 11 is a perfect day, we're going with a 10. Not quite perfect because of this, that high temperature still above average, but at least it's below 90, 89 degrees for a high with mostly sunny skies. And then look at the rest of the forecast for the next seven days. You'll see the highs near 87 on Sunday and Monday for Labor Day. And again, those morning lows in the 60s Sunday and Monday again on Tuesday, mid 60s for a low. But then we go back to a 20% chance for a shower late Tuesday. Rain chances back to 40% Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, and that corresponds with that increase in additional moisture in the air. So that brings the rain chances up with high temperatures around 86, 87 degrees for the middle and end of the week. This pandemic has hit so many Americans in so many ways from lost work to contracting COVID-19 to losing loved ones. But when all three of those happened to one Jonesboro woman, she didn't give up. She gave back. Cheryl Preheim has more. It's just something that we do. We love to serve. Taisha Alexander has always had a heart to help. For 12 years, she did that in classrooms as an elementary school computer teacher at Griffin Spalding County Schools. In March, she says she was told to make lesson plans for at-home teaching. The district was only expecting to do virtual learning for two weeks. I wasn't thinking that it was that serious at the time, but once it hit home, Days later, Taisha's brother-in-law tested positive for COVID-19. The same day he died from complications, Taisha tested positive for the virus too. They were among the first cases reported in Metro Atlanta. I got a lot of backlash from it. People 
spamming and hurtful things. Taisha recovered and her experience compelled her to help more. She knew there was important work to do. I just couldn't sit back and not pursue this opportunity to where I could help someone who needed my help. She went to work with Care Atlanta Food Bank and volunteered extra time delivering food to the elderly and low income families during the pandemic. It's nothing like being able to help someone. It, it gives you a feeling that's indescribable. Taisha says there is no shame in asking for support because she's been there too. I know what it feels like to be in isolation, to not be able to do for yourself, to not be able to go out. You know, we never know. It could be them today and me tomorrow, and I'm going to want somebody to help me. Well, Taisha is back teaching her students virtually and something she says she supports after her own experience with COVID. Things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Are you looking to add some history to your long holiday weekend? Well, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights is back open after COVID-19 forced it shut down for months, of course. There are new precautions in place. All visitors must wear masks and must buy a ticket in advance. For hours and more information, just check out civilandhumanrights.org. We're going to see dry weather as we go through the long holiday weekend, and it's still going to be warm, but just not as hot as it has been. Today's high was 92. Tomorrow will be 89. And then morning lows on Sunday and Monday, a little lower in the 60s. Not too bad there with afternoon highs in the 80s. Not only not raining, but also lower relative humidity value. So a nicer feel to the air. Back to a 20% chance for a shower Tuesday, then a 40% chance Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday with highs in the 80s. Looking good. All right, we will see you on Up Late at 11 on our sister station, 11 Alive. Thanks for joining us.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. High school football is back, but not without some COVID-19 ramifications and precautions. Tonight, what parents think of the safety measures. And the Trump administration temporarily pauses evictions for millions of Americans amid the pandemic. Why one advocate thinks the move doesn't go far enough. An unexpected catch on the Georgia River. Look what I found. Man, <laughs> 30 guns may have ended up in the water, some from the 1800s. But we begin with Friday Night Lights 2020. Georgia's beloved football season is underway, along with some pandemic precautions and some problems too. Some schools canceled tonight's games because student athletes contracted COVID-19. And some other high school teams hit the field with caution. John Sherrick is live outside Walton High School in East Cobb. He begins our coverage. John, I like seeing you cover high school football after all these years. <laughs> Friday Night Lights, it's back. Well, you know, parents and students and athletes all understand what is at stake here now, in addition to their health, because they say they have to follow the safety rules or COVID could crash the entire football season. At Kell versus Walton in East Cobb County, ticket sales were limited on purpose to reduce the crowds and support social distancing. Some in the stands did stay apart and wear masks, some not so much, but everyone hoping to save the football season by not spreading the virus. I think everybody out here wants to have a football season and wants to have a long one, so they're going to take every precaution they have to make sure that that happens. I think this is going to work out fine as long as we can just do what's expected as far as just following the guidelines. I'm a high risk, so I understand, but I do feel that all the precautions that they've put into place 
that um, that will be safe, especially since it's outdoors and everything. Still, parents like Karen Buckman are staying away and keeping their children out of sports for now. Too much of a risk for them until the COVID numbers decline. It is a math thing. It is a numbers thing. But I think we could all do well with treating each other giving each other a little bit of slack on the situation, treating each other with a little bit more kindness and understanding, and maybe not turning it into such a divisive political type issue. A tough decision for a lot of families. Well, COVID is certainly having its mark on high school football. As you say, some games were canceled tonight because people on those teams tested positive for COVID. But as it is, the football season will continue across the state for now with some COVID cancellations expected week to week. All right, John Sherrick, thank you. As we head into the Labor Day weekend, the downward trend in new COVID cases seems to have stalled a bit. Take a look at this graph here. Today, the Department of Public Health reported nearly 2,100 new positive test results. That is significantly higher than the number we reported on Memorial Day, a weekend seen as the start to the summer surge. On that day, DPH reported 498 cases. Sadly, the number of people dying with the virus is also high and holding steady. DPH reported 63 more deaths today. And remember, these are reported as DPH is able to verify the information. So many of these people actually died weeks ago. A sweeping halt on nationwide evictions went into effect today. It's a major temporary move from the Trump administration to help out millions of Americans at risk of eviction due to the pandemic. Yeah, our Hope Ford spoke to a housing advocate who thinks it doesn't go far enough. People cannot pay rent on $12 an hour. You just really cannot do that. So now it's even more exposed because now they really can't go get a second job because the business are hurting. Monica Delancey is a renter's advocate based in Cobb County. She says the new eviction moratorium is good, but not enough. We need long-term solutions. We need a housing that's really truly affordable. In order to meet the criteria to prevent eviction, a renter must prove they can't expect to make more than $99,000 this year, are experiencing a substantial loss of household income or medical expenses, prove an eviction would likely lead to homelessness, and make their best effort to make partial payments. Please don't let your rent just pile up. Because we don't want to be looking at December, you own ten, fifteen thousand dollars The order doesn't prevent evictions. It only delays them. Delancey worries many people will be in the same situation come January 1st, and families will be removed from their homes, something she once experienced. My daughter is still traumatized from that. She's still traumatized. She hopes local governments will continue to partner with nonprofits to help stabilize families, keeping as many people as possible from facing homelessness once the moratorium lifts. Evictions for reasons besides not paying rent will be allowed. The government says that landlords could face criminal penalties if they violate the ban. Renters can file a declaration to prove their hardship to their landlords. You can find the details on our website, 11alive.com. Well, if you live in DeKalb County, you may have woken up to this health alert reminding people about measures to take over the holiday weekend to curb the spread of COVID-19. It is a message that was echoed today by Governor Brian Kemp. He and the First Lady traveling around the state reminding people not to let their guards down over the Labor Day weekend. Mara Sirianni has more from DeKalb County. Governor Kemp's message ahead of the holiday weekend. He says, don't let your guard down and let's keep Georgia moving in the right direction. This progress can be erased very quickly if we grow complacent and ignore the guidance and public safety measures that we have in place. Governor Kemp shared his message this morning before getting on a plane to tour the state. Ahead of the Labor Day weekend, he's asking all Georgians to do four things. Wear your mask, practice social distancing, wash hands often, and follow his executive order. Kemp pointed to Memorial Day weekend and the 4th of July as two examples of when Georgia saw a surge in COVID cases and hospitalizations. Georgia's governor has been criticized by some for not enforcing a mandatory statewide mask mandate. Today, Kemp asked everyone to be responsible. But there's also people that don't need a government mandate to do the right thing. And that's why I'm here today asking people to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, and follow those four simple guidelines. Today, Governor Kemp is also making stops in Valdosta, Augusta, and Savannah. Two brothers find dozens of guns in a metro river, a whole mess of guns. Now police are trying to figure out if they are lost, keepsakes, connected to crimes, 
where exactly they came from. Adam and Jacob Coward have been magnet fishing all over Georgia. How about these guys using a lever with a large magnet to pull metal objects from the water? Now that's a hobby. Forget about <laughs> fishing and golf, man. This is where it's at. They have found everything from dirt bikes to radiators to newspaper stands. If you can think of it, they found it. But when they fished in the murky waters of the North Oconee River in Athens, they found a whole cache of weapons. Uh, in the beginning, it was more a little bit more modern guns, um, 80s, 90s type pistols. And then it kind of went back to just old revolvers, old like small caliber 22 revolvers. Some were probably even from the 1800s. Overwhelmed with uh, excitement and disbelief of what we found, you know, and, and just pulling out a, a gun that you know that's not supposed to be in there. And the magnitude of guns we pulled out was just, it was unbelievable. A year from today, those guys are going to be big reality TV stars, let me tell you. How about those guns? They are ancient, and not that one, though. Investigators are now processing the guns to see if they were involved in any crimes. A traffic stop on Georgia 400 ends with two custodians from South Forsyth High School facing drug charges. Police say they found several bags of meth inside Katrina Herrick's car. Fellow custodian Brent Charlie was also charged. The Forsyth Board of Education says they are no longer employed by the district. Attorneys for singer R. Kelly filed a motion today asking a federal judge to release him. R. Kelly is appealing a ruling that denied his release pending trial. The federal judge that initially denied it called him a flight risk. Mr. Kelly is awaiting trials on multiple sex crime charges in four jurisdictions in three states. And DeKalb County police searching for this man seen without a shirt attacking a man at a bus stop. The victim, Bruce Mitchell, died days later at the hospital. It happened on August 17th near Wesley Chapel and Snapfinger Woods Drive. Yesterday, police arrested the man you see wearing the white shirt, charging him with murder. Police say the pair were trying to rob that victim. Cafe in Midtown vandalized. The owner took his frustrations to social media, and he couldn't believe what happened next. Randy Adler says that vandals destroyed his garden at Babs Midtown last weekend. They broke sculptures, they threw trash, just made a mess. They destroyed the flowers that he planted in honor of his mother, who died of COVID-19 earlier this year. Adler posted about the crime, which has been shared hundreds of times. We had people in the neighborhood walk by dropping off cash, plants. I had to get my landscaper to pick up plants. We ran out of room. We had groups offering, you know, what can we help you clean up and do? It's, it's been overwhelming, to say the least. So the garden is now clean. It's reopened with the help of a lot of friends in the neighborhood, in the community. Babs Midtown is one of the oldest restaurants in Midtown and always has a good crowd out front. A very weak system with limited moisture is bringing a couple of showers through North Georgia and right there trying to move into the northern parts of Cobb County. Stay with us. We'll let you know if this is going to make it to Atlanta and if we'll dry out for the rest of the weekend. Coronavirus is hitting the veteran community pretty hard. How Veterans Affairs facilities are finding ways to adapt during the pandemic. Minute to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
The latest census data is now showing there are 18.6 million military veterans in the United States. The majority are over the age of 60 and in the coronavirus high risk group. Today, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs is reporting a somber milestone, 3,044 deaths from COVID-19, more than 53,000 veterans and a VA employees have contracted the virus. And of that number, there are almost 3,000 active cases. Here in Georgia, the VA reports that 82 veterans have died from COVID-19. There are currently 131 active cases, nearly 2,000 veterans, and a VA uh, employee now is recovering from the virus. Georgia is the fastest growing state in the country when it comes to veterans, and that is according to the U.S. Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Robert Wilkie. He visited the Atlanta VA today, giving an update from Director Ann Brown on the impacts of the coronavirus. Secretary Wilkie spoke about ways the facility has adapted to help more veterans despite the pandemic. In a normal month, Atlanta VA conducts 950 telehealth appointments. During the pandemic, that number has gone to 20,000. That means we're reaching veterans where they live. Secretary Wilkie did not address ongoing concerns about adequate protective equipment for VA workers. Nurses rallied outside the Atlanta VA Medical Center back in April, complaining the lack of masks and other supplies put them at risk. And last month, a report obtained by Kaiser Health News showed Georgia was facing a substantial shortage of PPE at the same time, Governor Brian Kemp began lifting pandemic restrictions. You will find more on that report as well as a daily breakdown of Georgia's coronavirus numbers in our 11 Live app. And we have a special section dedicated to bringing you the facts and not fear all about the pandemic. We can see some clear skies for the Labor Day weekend. All in favor of that say aye, aye. I, I. I. <laughs> Chief, <laughs> Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb is here to join us with the Labor Day weekend forecast. You know, and we deserve it. You know, we've got a big surplus right now, about 13 and a half inches above average in rainfall. We've had this pattern of afternoon and evening storms. We've been dry for the past couple of days, and it looks like we're going to be dry for the next few days as well. We have another quick moving system that's moving through our area right now. It has very limited moisture with it. There are just a few raindrops right now on the northern parts of Paul County trying to move into North Cobb. A few light showers here over Alatoona Lake trying to move into parts of Cherokee County as well. The moderate part of this right here, the yellow that you see is still right on the Paulding and Bartow County line. Now earlier we had some orange with this indicating a little more moderate to even heavier rain, but this has really been weakening as it's been moving closer to us. In fact, you can see that now some of that came through South Floyd earlier into Bartow County and as that moves into Northern Cobb, it is falling apart. We think that trend is going to continue, that it's going to fall apart. And it's all part of that system. That's what we were telling you about last night with a weak moving system with limited moisture that'll move our way just to get only a 20% chance for a shower over North Georgia. That's what's happening now. Once this moves through, this is going to reinforce the drier air in place. And I'm talking about not only just no rain, but also lower humidity is going to start moving in too. Here's a live look in Rome where the roads are dry and the south of Rome. We had a couple of those showers earlier, but nothing much in the downtown area. So a nice night there, but it is mild. Rome right now, you're still in the 80s. At 83 degrees. We're still in the 80s here in Atlanta, too, at 82 degrees. We have lower 80s in Marietta, Duluth, Gainesville, Athens, also 80s in Eatonton. Everybody else is pretty much in those 70s, and we're going to see temperatures in the morning in the lower 70s here in town. You can see these temperatures as they are still be at 80 around midnight and then falling into the 70s, starting in the lower 70s tomorrow. Clear skies here with sunshine early in the morning, no rain around, and it's going to be a great day with temperatures warming up to just shy of 90 degrees. I think we'll hit 89 for our high. You know, we rate your weather on a scale from 1 to 11. We're going to go with a 10. It's going to be mostly sunny to partly cloudy. Um, not in the 90s, so that's a good thing, but we're still above average. The average high for this time of year is 86. We'll be about 3 degrees above the average. That's why it's not a perfect day. And then as we go into Sunday, we'll see even some drier air moving our way, and that's going to help our Sunday morning temperatures go down. But here's Saturday, a little bit of an easterly flow. It might give us a couple of clouds here and there to mix in with the sunshine. And then as we go into Sunday, we start off with temperatures in the 60s in town and outside the city. So that's going to be a nice change there with slightly cooler air with that drier air in place. And then at noon, still mostly sunny in the afternoon, mostly sunny on Sunday too, and that dry pattern will persist into Monday as well. Let's get a 
check of the tropics right now. Remember Omar, it's falling apart, barely even uh, holding on as a tropical depression. It's probably going to be a remnant low with the 11 p.m. advisory. But we have three other systems out in the central and eastern Atlantic. This one is going to fall apart, we think, a 20 to 30 percent chance for a development there over the next five days. This one is the one that as it moves into this zone here, it's going to have a much higher chance of developing, about an 80 percent chance of developing. And then this other one coming off the coast of Africa in this orange development zone has about a 60% chance of developing there too. Still really far away. It's going to take a while if these systems even make it to the United States. 89 for a high on Saturday, 87 on Sunday, and also on Labor Day with morning lows on Sunday and Monday in the 60s. That's not too bad. Tens on the wasometer Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Tuesday, a 20% chance for a shower late, and then better rain chances moving in for Wednesday, Thursday, also on Friday. Take a look at your weather wow picture for the day. This is from one of our 11 Live Community Storm Trackers, Mary Beth Etheridge in Stockbridge. Nice blue sky, few little clouds out there uh, earlier today, but again, celebrating no rain in the area. We'd love to see your weather wow moment, and we get these many times from our 11 Live Community Storm Trackers. You can be a part of that group on Facebook. Just search 11 Alive Community Storm or 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Ask to become a member and we'll let you in. Well, Chris already told us the weather is looking good for this holiday weekend, but what if you want to add a little history and culture to the holiday weekend? The National Center for Civil and Human Rights is back open after COVID-19 forced it to shut down for months. There are now new pr precautions in place. All visitors must wear masks and must buy tickets in advance. For hours and more information, check out civilandhumanrights.org. And if you'd like to treat your taste buds, you are in luck. Black History or rather Black Restaurant Week kicks off today. Dozens of restaurants and food trucks around Atlanta are taking part offering special menus. The week has created, was created to highlight black owned restaurants in the wake of the pandemic and nationwide protest against police brutality. There's been an even bigger focus on reviving black owned businesses this year. It runs through September 13th and we have a list of participating restaurants for you on 11alive.com. Love it. Still to come, a teacher dealing with personal Personal pain and loss from COVID finds healing in helping others. Her story when we return. At noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. 
because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised. The pandemic has hit so many Americans in so many ways, from lost work to contracting COVID to losing loved ones. But when all three happened to one Jonesboro woman, she didn't give up. She gave back. And our Cheryl Preheim has more. It's just something that we do. We love to serve. Taisha Alexander has always had a heart to help. For 12 years, she did that in classrooms as an elementary school computer teacher at Griffin Spalding County Schools. In March, she says she was told to make lesson plans for at-home teaching. The district was only expecting to do virtual learning for two weeks. I wasn't thinking that it was that serious at the time, but once it hit home. Days later, Taisha's brother-in-law tested positive for COVID-19. The same day he died from complications, Taisha tested positive for the virus too. They were among the first cases reported in Metro Atlanta. I got a lot of backlash from it, people saying mean and hurtful things. Taisha recovered and her experience compelled her to help more. She knew there was important work to do. I just couldn't sit back and not pursue this opportunity to where I could help someone who needed my help. She went to work with Care Atlanta Food Bank and volunteered extra time delivering food to the elderly and low income families during the pandemic. It's nothing like being able to help someone. It, it gives you a feeling that indescribable. Taisha says there is no shame in asking for support because she's been there too. I know what it feels like to be in isolation, to not be able to do for yourself, to not be able to go out. You know, we never know. It could be them today and me tomorrow, and I'm going to want somebody to help me. Well, Taisha is back teaching her students virtually. It is something she says she supports after her own experience with COVID. What an inspirational story that, was that a great she story. has. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Cheryl always has great stories. Indeed. Well, Jeff, good to see you tonight, but <laughs> I'm heading out to get ready for up late in about 30 minutes on 11 Alive. Sounds good, but I want to give you a formal, uh, you know, a, really an invitation to stay with us. If, if you want to <laughs> just hang out another 36 minutes, it's really open to that. I appreciate the invitation, but I'm going to pass <laughs> okay. this time. All right, we're done. I'm going to pass. Right. Natisha, thanks a lot. We'll see you on 11 Alive in 36 minutes. All right. Stranded All right. aboard for months. Now one Metro Atlanta woman is finally reunited with her family. How she found her way back home. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. 
on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of. New video tonight showing thieves hitting a bucket jewelry store for a second time this year. Really the second time in the last 90 days. The owner telling Joe Hankey it is a lot to bear after vandals looted the store in May when a night of protest turned violent. After the first break in back in May at a state jewelers behind me here in Buckhead, the owners tell me they spent several months cleaning up all the damage and restocking their inventory. They were almost back to business as normal. And then last night it happened all over again. At 12.45 this morning, surveillance video shows three people breaking into a state jewelers. They shattered the display cases, loaded up a box with jewelry, broke into the back of the store, but the owners say the thieves cannot open the safe. Timestamps show after one minute and 51 seconds, the trio takes off. Eight minutes later, an Atlanta police car drives up. Watching the video, Ala Isakov says is heartbreaking. Her family owns the state jewelers. Isakov says they are still adding up the stolen jewelry and damages, but it will be in the tens of thousands of dollars. It's just a mess. It's sad. It's glass everywhere. I'm still a little shaken. Um, we're trying to recover from the last break in, and then we, we walk into this again. Walking into this again, this video from May 30th shows around a dozen people breaking in. A night of protests over racial injustice in downtown Atlanta turned violent, and people looted stores from downtown to Buckhead. Isaacov says the damage and stolen property totaled $90,000, and so far police have not given them any updates on the investigation. This night in May temporarily closed the business. We were just trying to clean up, so we just finally set up again and, and restored all the showcases and set it up to where we can be functional again, just to start from the beginning. Now today they're cleaning up again. Whether any of the same people from the May break-in broken again last night is unknown. They had masks on, they had gloves on, and you can't even see their faces, so it's hard to tell. Atlanta police tonight needing help solving both break-ins. Anyone with information is asked to contact APD. Two mailboxes wrapped in plastic outside the post office on Fulton Industrial Boulevard are catching the attention of customers and passerbyers, too. We reached out to the U.S. Postal Service to find out why they've wrapped and what customers ought to be doing in the meantime. The USPS sent us this statement saying the collection boxes out of service because of a broken lock. Customers can still drop off mail inside the post office until the boxes are fixed. If you believe there is a problem with your mail, you can call the USPS inspection services and they will help you out. The back to school question is a thorny one for many parents. Should kids be back in the classroom or should they be at home? That decision even more difficult in intergenerational households with a virus disproportionately attacking the elderly and often carried silently by the young. Our digital producer, Jonathan Raymond, takes a closer look. I think we are going to just wing it until we can't wing it anymore. <laughs> and I mean, not knowing how long this is gonna be a thing, that's why I'm just like, okay, am I going to be my kid? Many of the families that we serve 
have diabetes, hypertension, and other chronic diseases. A lot of the families we serve, they want the children to be back in school. They know that's a great place for the kids. 30% of the grandparents in our program are over age 60, and we have grandparents in their 70s, and sometimes in their 80s who are raising grandchildren. So the transmission across generations is a, um, a legitimate concern that they have. If you have a multi-generational household, the, the older people definitely are at the highest risk. You know, and I do have one in my house. My parents live with me and I have a four and a half year old. I've made the decision to send him to his preschool summer camp. And you know, I did discuss that with my parents. But having a four and a half year old, it's virtually impossible to make him understand that he needs to be away from his grandparents. He's just not going to do that. But if you have an older child, that may be a conversation you try to have. You know, it's very hard as a parent not to let your emotions come into this, but I think you really need to look at the cases in your area. You need to look at what is your school doing to try to protect your child. Do you think that's sufficient? Do you think it's not sufficient? Have there been cases in the school already? In your community, what's happening? All those factors should go into making that decision. To see more of our interviews for the story, look for it in the As Seen on TV section of the 11 Alive app. Before the pandemic, Atlanta expected a big economic boost this weekend, including the Chick-fil-A kickoff games and Dragon Con. Nearly 90,000 people were slated to visit Atlanta for Dragon Con, but for the first time in 34 years, the science fiction, fantasy, and pop culture convention now is going virtual. As for football, all three Chick-fil-A kickoff games this year canceled. How does that really affect the bottom line? The Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau says more than $86 million were estimated to pour into the city from Dragon Con. The Chick-fil-A kickoff game previously scheduled for Saturday, $35 million, with $30 million estimated to come in from the Labor Day game. Not happening now. Atlanta started the year with 39 conventions on the calendar. Dozens of those conventions were then canceled because of the pandemic. The total estimated economic impact for the events, $600 and $40 million. For six months, a local woman was stranded thousands of miles away from her family as COVID brought travel to a halt. Tonight, she's finally back home, thanks to some help from the intrepid Bill Liss, who is, of course, a great fixture here at 11 Alive over the decades, doing good wherever he goes. Last October, Sarah Vick journeyed to Calcutta, India on a film production assignment. She expected to be home in Flowery Branch early in the new year. Then COVID-19 raced across India and the country came to a grinding halt. Borders closed, flights were canceled, people stayed closeted in their homes. And for the next six months, Vic was trapped. She tried everything to get home, but got nowhere. It was just chaotic and it was, it had gotten to the point where it was a bit hopeless. I just felt like I was starting to think I was gonna be in India forever. <laughs> For Vic, getting home was critical. Her mom, Lisa Robbins, is a cancer patient, and her brother, Josh, has Down syndrome and autism. When we learned that Sarah was stranded in Calcutta, we immediately reached out to United Airlines executives in Chicago. They wasted no time, and their people in India reached out immediately to Sarah by cell phone, and she was booked on a flight to come home. I am very, very anxious. I feel, I feel so anxious, I feel nauseous. <laughs> and today, she arrived. 11 Alive photojournalist Stephen Boise was at Hartsfield Jackson as Sarah reunited with her mom 10 months after leaving Flowery Branch. I didn't foresee being able to come home until whenever the pandemic was over and India opened their borders. So this is, I, I just told her, I feel like I had almost started to forget just how much I missed her until I saw her. So just so much thank you and gratitude for it. I feel like I can breathe. <laughs> that is such a wonderful story, isn't it? Marvelous. 
The Rochester Police Union now speaking publicly for the first time since news of Daniel Prude's death came out. Prude, an African-American man, died back in March after seven police officers tried to restrain him. Union President Mike Mazeo held a news conference discussing the union's knowledge of Mr. Prude's death. He says the police chief's office told him there were no concerns with the action of the seven officers involved. But those seven officers have been suspended. Mazio said the release of an edited version of the incident does not provide a full picture of what happened during the arrest, and he hopes for a transparency in the state's criminal investigation. Police have charged an Arizona man with kidnapping after he appears to walk out of a grocery store with a cart that had somebody else's child in it. According to police, a woman with an infant in her grocery cart was paying for her groceries. The man walked over to the cart, took it, and started to walk out of the store. The mother reacted quickly and stopped the man. Police used the video to identify him and catch him. A month after a deadly chemical explosion in Beirut, there is hope for more survivors. Search teams with the help of technology detected what could be someone alive beneath the rubble. That is impossible to comprehend. Here's NBC's Matt Bradley with more on the search. Rescue workers in Beirut are still racing to try to find some living victims. Now, it seems unlikely, even impossible, that exactly one month after that catastrophic explosion that tore through so much of downtown Beirut, that someone might still be alive under the rubble. It was a Chilean rescue dog who first got a whiff of this body. It could be a corpse or it could be a living person underneath the rubble. And when rescue workers came back to the scene with instruments to measure to see if there was any sign of life, they did detect some kind of pulsing. It was at something like 14 to 16 beats per minute, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be a heartbeat. It could be a wristwatch, it could be anything but it's enough to go on. And rescue workers now are furiously trying to dig into that rubble to extract what could be one or two living people. Since then, that heart rate, if it's a heart rate, has decreased to about seven beats per minute. That means that these rescue workers really are racing against time. Coming up next, President Trump on the defensive tonight about a canceled trip to honor fallen military heroes. We have a weak system moving through our area right now. Very moisture starved, only a couple little showers. Stay with us. We'll let you know what happens after that, it, after that system moves through and whether or not it's going to reinforce our dry air for the weekend. Team 1-1 is back. High school highlights from the opening Friday of high school football coming up next. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. 
because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people. President Trump denies reports that he referred to America's deceased military members as losers. Joe Biden says if the reporting is true, the president's unfit to be commander in chief. Here's Alice Barr with the very latest from Washington. President Trump forcefully pushing back today against reporting in The Atlantic magazine that he called dead American service members losers and suckers. It was a totally fake story, and that was confirmed by many people who were actually there. Uh, it was a terrible thing that somebody could say the kind of things, and especially to me, because I've done more for the military than almost anybody else. The Atlantic article describes a canceled 2018 trip to a U.S. military cemetery in France, citing four people with firsthand knowledge who claim the president said, quote, why should I go to that cemetery? It's filled with losers. Several current and former aides insisting the trip was canceled because rain made it too dangerous to fly. But the language harkens back to President Trump's comments about now deceased Senator John McCain, who survived more than five years as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, whose late son served in Iraq, seizing on the story today. If these statements are true, the president should humbly apologize to every gold star mother and father and every Blue Star family that he's denigrated and insulted. Who the heck does he think he is? A progressive veterans group out today with a searing ad aimed at the president. My son is not a loser. A broadside against a commander in chief who casts himself as the military's strongest ally. This controversy comes on a day when the White House wanted to promote job gains for the month of August. The unemployment rate dropped to 8.4 percent. Chris. If you've been watching us this evening, you know we've been tracking some of those very light showers and very spotty showers that were moving out of Tennessee and Alabama. Well, this is all that's left of that. You can see that one cell that we were watching coming out of Floyd County through parts of Bartow County over Alatoona Lake, northern parts of Paulding County, northern Cobb County. Well, look, it's gone now. We were expecting it to fall apart. It has fallen apart and it's no longer uh, producing any rain. Just a few little clouds out there and that's really all of the rain that we have with this moisture starved system that's been pushing in from Tennessee and Alabama. A couple of little showers left over there in the mountains of North Carolina. We also had some green showing up here because of false echoes on the radar. Not all of that was actually rain coming down. Here's a live look in Athens on a Friday night there on a holiday weekend where the roads are dry and not a lot of action right there on the streets. As you can see right there as we're looking down over North Campus and on downtown. Well, you know, we saw that dark picture right there, but have you noticed that it is getting darker earlier. And there's a big change between last night's sunset. Well, it's not really a big change, but it's a two minute change there between last night's sunset and tonight's sunset. Last night, the sun set at eight o'clock. So that was the last sunset at eight o'clock or after eight o'clock that we're going to have until next spring. Tonight's sunset at 758. So those sunsets are going to be getting earlier and earlier. It's going to be getting darker 
earlier as well. Now, one good thing to have, though, is some drier air that is moving our way. And you know, today we didn't have any rain around. We didn't have rain yesterday or the day before, but we still had a lot of humidity in the air that made it feel kind of muggy. Well, those dew points are coming down and you can see here uh, when we have dew points in the 60s, that's humid, humid, but not as oppressive as when it's in the 70s. And then when we dip down into the 50s for dew points, that's a really comfortable feel to the air. And so you're going to notice that later on Saturday and then definitely on Sunday and Monday with that lower humidity that we're going to have in our area. And with the lower dew points, that's also going to help our morning temperatures on Sunday, Monday and Tuesday go down too. Here's another look at that. You can see here uh, the moisture map showing where you have the the, the uh, yellows and greens. That's when it starts getting a little more moist there. The blues, that's where it is drier air and that starts filtering in during the day tomorrow and then really reinforcing the drier air here for Sunday and also on Monday. So this times out perfectly for the long holiday weekend to not only have rain, but also have that lower humidity and not quite as much out there and then as we go into Tuesday a little more moisture starts coming back but then more Wednesday Thursday and Friday and that moisture increase will correspond with the rain chances that'll be going up for the end of the week too. So dry weather conditions Saturday, Sunday and Monday tens on the wasometer with highs in the 80s right around 87 Sunday and Monday morning lows in the 60s though 88 Tuesday with the rain chance late in the day at 20% and then a 40% chance for showers Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Well, we certainly had our doubts, but here we are. Another year of Team 1-1 high school football, and this is unlike any other year. Tonight, the first Friday night of the season, nearly every school limiting crowd size. And there are two goals in mind, to try to keep everybody as safe as possible, and then to crown a state champion come this December, which seems like a long way away. To do that, you've got to play. So we start with Kel and Walton from our friends from Born to Compete. Here goes. First time since 09, these teams have faced each other. Kel and Walton, oh yeah, the Corky Kel Classic. It is Kenny Daha breaking the tackle. He will go all the way for the touchdown Raiders. It is a great way to go. Number seven, like Michael Vick, sprinting toward that end zone. Kel would keep it close. The reverse to David Badinga, and he goes around everybody. It's a touchdown for Kel. For Walton, <laughs> it's it's tough out there. Watch carefully. Zach Rosman going down, and he doesn't. The knee never touches the ground. He gets up, keeps running. Touchdown. Walton is your winner tonight by a touchdown. They get it done. The wood chopped, as Kirby Smart would say. 35-28 is the final. Wesleyan starting its road back to the championship after finishing last season as the runner-up. They're on the road at Mount Pisgah, not that far away from Wesleyan, off 141. Scoreless opening quarter. Cooper Blouser taking the handoff. He is something. A big run for Blouser. Is that name familiar? You remember Jeff Blouser? Of course you do, the former Brave. And also, this leads to Griffin Caldwell. Pretty good one-two punch for the Wesleyan Wolves. Caldwell scoring to make it 7 0. Now, in the second quarter, we move on as the short pass here to Blouser. Athletic like his father, far sideline. He does the rest. 87 yards. Blouser getting most of it himself. The touchdown makes it 14 0. Congratulations to Team Blouser. Big win for the Wolves tonight, 45 14. I like that Wesleyan team. I always like that Wesleyan team. Go Wolves. A rematch of the 6A state championship. Alatuna taking on the champs. Harrison, Alatuna looking for a play, looking for whatever they can get. Marcus Blizzard going for the sack and kept it close in the first half. The Hoya scored a field goal to end the first half, but the points came in the second half. Hoyas blocked a punt, and then they returned it for a play. You can see it right there. Oh, yeah, you see the enthusiasm, too. Alatuna kept on fighting a huge touchdown pass to Caleb Moore to get him on the board. Alatuna would unload after that. They take down the defending champions. Super victory for them tonight. 27-17 is the final.
Our team won one game of the week. Five-time defending champs Elka taking on Woodward Academy. Good rivalry here. 41 seconds left in scoreless of the second quarter. Philip Massengale, the Wildcat, keeps it up the middle for score of the night. 7-0. PAT was good for the Chargers. Woodward with an opportunity to score right before halftime, but a fumble, a turnover in the red zone. That would snuff it out. Elka takes over. They take the lead, and they win 14-0. The beat goes on as Elka just keeps on winning year after year. Seven inning game. The pitch. Braves split a doubleheader with the Nationals tonight. The offense looked good in both. Ronald Acuna Jr. hit three home runs in the two games. Freddie Freeman blasted his first career grand slam in game two. Braves win the opener 7-1, and they drop the nightcap 10-9. We'll have a lot more highlights, a lot more interviews, a lot more fun. Not that this wasn't fun, but on 11 Alive in just a few minutes. We'll be back to wrap things up right after this. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I hope you're ready for a dry holiday weekend. That's not bad, right? But it's still going to be warm, but just not as hot as it has been. 89 for a high on Saturday. Sunday and Monday morning, temperatures back down into the 60s with some drier air in place. It'll be a nice feel to the air. Highs around 87, still rain free for Sunday and Monday. A low risk for a shower coming back in late on Tuesday. I really think the better chances for rain will be Thursday, actually Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Rain chances back up to about 40% with high temperatures right around 86, 87 degrees for the middle and end of next week. Wow, how sweet is that? Does that look great or what? I like having this table here. I feel like I'm some sort of vice presidential debate, you know? Maybe not. Have a great night, everybody. Have a great weekend.
all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going.